Our speaker this afternoon is Dr. Errol Saglam, who joined us from Istanbul. Dr. Saglam is a social anthropologist, teaching currently as a lecturer at Istanbul Medineyet University. Following, uh, I don't know if I pronounced it correctly. I hope that I did. It's all right. Okay. Uh, following his doctoral studies at uh, Birkbeck University of London, he worked as a postdoctoral fellow at Stockholm University and the Free University Berlin and a visiting scholar at the University of Cambridge. His publications deal with everyday configuration of Islamic piety in the Turkish context, ultranationalist vigilantism, bureaucracies, and the challenges facing ethnographic methodology. If I understand well, ethnographic methodology is a qualitative method of collective data through observations and interviews, and then using this data to draw conclusions about how societies and individuals function. We will close the lecture with a questions and answer session. You can type your questions at any time by clicking on the Q&A bot at the box at the bottom of your screen. This will open another screen where you can type your questions. Those attending the event on Facebook can type their questions on the comments box on the left of the bottom of the screen. screen. Dr. Saglam, the screen is yours. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you to Konstantin first and Stefanos for inviting me here. It's also almost midnight in Istanbul. So apologies in advance for if I'm not too alert or but I will do my best anyhow. Okay, I will just start with my talk quickly and then uh, I will just you know see if you have any questions afterwards. And since the collapse of the Ottoman Empire in the 20, early 20th century, social composition of Asia Minor, as you all know, of course, especially that of the Black Sea coast, have been radically changed, while the experiences of displaced communities have been explored extensively in Greece, the team has remained relatively obscure in the Turkish context because uh, social differences are generally frowned upon in uh, Turkey, or at least this was the case till the last uh, two decades. Dis discussions around what is left behind by displaced or destroyed Greek communities has overall been confined to the Western Anatolia, Aegean region, where material remnants of Greek communities are still visible. And yet, despite being one of the epicenters of Greek culture per se, such things exist in a coherent or bounded forms, how do how such displacement and destruction of Greek communities reverberate across the Black Sea coast does not feature that much in uh, public discussions in contemporary Turkey. Given the strength of Turkish nationalist sentiments among local communities, especially in the city of Trabzon, Greek heritage has long been presumed to have been uprooted from the contemporary Black Sea literal in general. And in this presumption, this presumption is where I want to raise my questions about the ways in which Greek heritage and an analytic category rather than a perennial phenomenon, there's a question that I want to tackle head on. Can heritage be uprooted in such manner? If not, how does it live on? In, the, in this case, of course, the heritage is Greek heritage. I will draw on my re ethnographic research in Trabzon ongoing since 2015. And then I will ask questions about the persistence and transmutations of uh, Greek heritage in contemporary Turkey. Of course, uh, when we think of Trabzon, a city in the Northeast uh, Turkey, as you saw in the previous map, uh, you come to think, you know, if those, you know, for those who are familiar with the Turkish context, you will automatically think uh, one of the strongholds of Turkish nationalism and Sunni Islamic conservatism. In 2013, for instance, the Hagia Sophia of Trabzon was converted to a mosque into, uh, and this was seven years before the conversion of its more famous namesake in Istanbul. The city is also infamous for its suspicion towards Greek tourists a heavy-handed police presence in the Orthodox Christian masses in Sumela Monastery in every August the 15th, the blocking of the city port by locals to prevent the landing of the Orthodox Patriarch Bartolomeu, as well as the previous neglect 
and destruction of monasteries, uh, churches, and other public buildings, or their appropriation in a manner erasing all traces and signs of their Greek past. This public image of Trabzon is the hotbed of Turkish uh, reactionary Turkish nationalism, of course, contrasts rather sharply with the cosmopolitan past of the region, as well as the, that of the city of Trabzon. As Trabzon has been one of the epicenters of Hellenic culture throughout the last millennium. Some members of the uh, imperial family of the Eastern Roman Empire, as you would remember, uh, had settled in the city after the sack of Constantinople by the Latin forces in 1204 and established a successor state empire of Trabzon there. Since then, the city had a really strong um, Hellenic influence and a sizable Greek community, which dominated local culture, economy, and politics till uh, early 20th century. In the early 20th century, however, the Greek community of the literal has, first, has, first, has been first violently displaced, and by 1923, of course, all the remaining Greek-speaking Christians were forced to relocate to Greece as part of the famous Greco-Turkish population exchange, Mubadele in Turkish. My presentation tonight departs exactly from this, you know, the generalized assumption about the region and asks what happened to the Greek heritage since then? Has it simply been uprooted and erased? If not, how does it live on? I will now return to my field and then present a vignette to give you a glimpse of my take on these questions. In 2015, while conducting my field research in Trabzon about to explore how Turkish nationalist communities preserve and continue speaking an archaic variety of Greek called Romeka or Rumja in Turkish, I befriended an ambitious and hardworking local woman called Sunay. She normally resided in Paris and worked in fashion industry, but she was in her ancestral village for her summer break. As Sunay was fluent in Romeka, we talked about uh, you know, the, how the language reverberates across their social and political engagements in and beyond Trabzon. While we were ta talking, Sunay recounted the story of her uncle in law, Enişte in Turkish. Apparently, in the 1960s, Sunay's Enişte was a tailor working in Trabzon and decided to move to France for work with his friend from Machka, another region in Istanbul. It's just like one of the valleys uh, parallel to, um, it, in the map, you see it to the, toward the left of um, the, you know, the research area. As Enişte was also from the Off Valley, where there's, you know, you can see the big round shapes. This is where I did my field research as well. As Enişte was also from the Off Valley, he could speak Romeka, but apparently did not disclose this information to his companion, his friend from Machka. Regardless of how close they were, this remained a secret. As they arrived in Paris, though, you know, the, the duo went to Cade, where Greek tailors had already set up their shops. Approaching one of the tailors, Greek tailors, with, in his mother tongue, Snais Enishte uh, used Romeka to ask for job opportunities and explain their dire condition. Enishte, I was told, eventually succeeded in landing jobs for himself and his much color companion. And while he's much and fascinated by his friend's ability to communicate with Parisian shop owners, I was told, much color friend asked, like a Sunay Senishte, how smart are you? How did you learn French so fast? And a number of questions in inevitably emerges from this now distant and seemingly trivial encounter with a potential to shed some light on the dynamics of heritage in contemporary Turkey. First of all, how are we to understand the reluctance of Sunay Senishte to disclose his knowledge of Romeka, as well as his ability to communicate with Greek tailors in, of Kade? in Greek to his, you know, one of the good friends, apparently. Why would one be unwilling to disclose his mother tongue to his or her companion, supposedly so close that they traveled all the way from Turkey to France? And then complementing the surrounding of Greek heritage, how shall we understand the much of the friend's ignorance of it or non-knowledge of like any states uh, of Romeka's continued presence that he lives in a valley that is uh, socially you know, connected to Off Valley. So he must, we assume, must know what's going on in the neighboring valleys, but apparently he's oblivious to the fact that you know, the neighboring communities speak this archaic variety of Greek. 
Addressing these questions with other experiences from the field, I believe will also lead us to ask questions about the status of Greek heritage in contemporary Turkey. What does this, what does it, you know, the unwillingness of the Enishte to reveal his, uh, you know, the ability to speak Greek and uh, how does the, you know, the Greek heritage transfigure and then take new forms in contemporary Turkey? Does the public invisibility of Greek heritage in this case of Romeka, for instance, simply imply that some, such non-Turkish heritages must have already been uh, completely erased? If not, how are we to comprehend their enduring presences, albeit like, you know, in discrete modes, especially? What we are grappling here, I must underline, is by no means a matter exclusive uh, of the distant past. I was, as I was doing my research with Romeka speaking communities of the Off Valley, as you see here, I realized that Greek heritage was very much alive. Although the language had no writing system and the transmission has been severely curtailed by the migration to cities in the last 50 years, it had been still transmitted only orally across generations and was still used widely among men and women across the elevated villages of the Off Valley. This, you know, the area that is just, you know, the more uh, fluent is the second and bigger gray, uh, you know, the oval shaped thing there. You know, when you go toward the south, you see more fluency in the language in the like the more elevated villages. And yet, uh, I also noted that Romeka's visibility among like, the community was carefully managed within this reclusive communal setting, permeating the social life of the community and yet still remaining relatively invisible. Romeka has been secluded to familial, rather private and intimate encounters within the uh, community. And it was generally, uh, you know, the uh, held back almost like, you know, the, it was not used that much in public encounters outside the valley setting. My interlocutors often refrained from using the language in the presence of outsiders. And if they did and were caught, like, you know, using it, then they were always used misnomers such as Lazja, like Lazi is a, another language used in the uh, area, but it's more Kartvelian, so it's connected to Georgian, as you know, it's a different ethnic group, and to name the language and to do, avoid detection. The elusiveness and relative obscurity of Romeka, however, did not involve a complete concealment of its persons. It is uh, transiently disclosed to the outsiders in different modes, and then I suggest articulating interactions around Romeka as discrete societies, which are simultaneously in plain sight and yet invisible to most, requiring a degree of familiarity with an embeddedness in so local social relations. Romeka hence brought such rates the uh, social lives of communities I grew up with in the valley, and yet it, they, it, it eludes outsiders' recognition. This Discrete status, I argue, stems from the fact that Romeka heritage generates associations with Greece and Greek culture within the nationalist matrix. I can illustrate this point with another vignette from the field. While doing my research, of course, there was another parliamentary election in Turkey, and the daily interactions and the dialogue with local people provided valuable insight into how Turkish nationalist discourses could be widely and fervently circulated by a community that still spoke Romeka. I was particularly interested in how locals reconciled this, you know, the relatively unknown Greek heritage with their staunch Turkish nationalism and how this was articulated across their public and political discourses. At one such meeting, several political candidates presented their agenda. It was in a CHP um, um, and other you know, the political party offices. There are multiple party representatives in each district. So I was trying to attend as much as I could. In one such meeting, um, there was this um, uh, delivered speech by uh, one, you know, the young politicians or candidates for the parliamentary seats. And we will call him Hassan. He was a relatively younger candidate from Tonya and at the valley to the west of the city of Trabzon. And then his speech provided an intriguing twist. He deviated from the fervent and rather conspiratorial narrative of the preceding candidates 
but also went to great lengths to present himself as a local, like uh, his audience. Hassan began his speech by indicating that he was from Tonya, every link to the rest of the province, and underlined that, similar to his audience, uh, ever, he could also speak Rumja Romica, and he further indicated that he could also speak modern Greek, Yunanja, Greek of Greece, and, and then he added that he could, however, uh, you know, the not less uh, this, uh, you know, the ability to speak from uh, Greek fluently in his resume because others would misunderstand. He said, This is quote unquote. There is this kind of expression in Turkish, Yanlış anlamak, completely this kind of, you know, the, there's something wrong there. The room suddenly went silent. Romeka was glimpsed, but you know, hesitantly and then briefly to relieve the tension. The head of the local uh, party organization intervened with a joke, and Hassan delivered the rest of his speech in Turkish. Since most outsiders automatically take the preservation of Romeka as the proof of a Greek identity lying beneath the Turkish one, local communities Rome choose to reveal Romeka strategically and harshly oppose any insinuation that they are actually Greek. As a nationalist ideology expects a homogeneous and coherent identity, Romeka emerges as an uncanny element in a Freudian sense, element within which Turkish identity is intricately tied to one of its antagonistic others, the Greek one. Within this nationalist binary, within which one is to be either Greek or Turkish, Romeka is rendered irreconcilable with the Turkish identity because it symbolizes you know, this kind of you know, old and then established Greek identity. For this very reason, it seems to have been, you know, Romeka seems to have been banished from the public representation, with the locals especially refraining from using the Turkish name of the language Rumja, which has definitely connotations with the, um, you know, uh, Greek speaking Orthodox Christian communities of the Ottoman Empire. Other than a few sporadic mentions in linguistic analysis, Romeka has been overall unknown by the wider Turkish public. In addition to this discrete, discrete preservation, however, I noted that communities I work with conjured all places, you know, the old geographical marks in the valley in Romeka, detailing every, you know, the, you know, the uh, river pass, mountain, estate, clearing, uh, I don't know, woods, neighborhoods, villages, of course, definitely, and streams across the valley. And then they all had like a really unique Romeka name that only the locals knew of. Since the Turkish state strived to Turkify the length, landscape through toponymic changes since the 1970s, villages and neighborhoods across Trabzon have since been also been given new Turkish names. Locals, however, rarely use these new Turkish names, except in their official dealings with state institutions, and still overwhelmingly stick to their old Turk Romeka name. And in any case, the Romeka names provide a more detailed mapping of the valley. Landscapes in the valley, hence, carry symbolic undertones through the very ways they are conjured, much smaller in number, and marking merely the major elements of the local topography, such as villages and pastures, new Turkish names remain distant, distant to the everyday life in the valley. Romeka names, on the other hand, provide a detailed mapping of the local, local topography, evoking intimacy and communal privacy, as anyone speaking this language and knowing these Romeka toponyms must be from the valley. As an exclusive capacity of the local communities, this ability to name things in Romeka reiteratively stirs the language into the topography in its discrete presence, marking the landscape as both the site and the depository of this unpublic and silent heritage. I hence argue that one needs to be attuned to the transfigurations of Greek heritage in relation to wider sociopolitical changes, economic possibilities, and individual orientations. I'm not only talking about how the language is still spoken by Turkish nationalist communities per se, but also about the way the heritage takes elusive forms or inhabits landscapes, or, or, and also how its, its persistence conjures up new modalities of remembering to retain what has long been abjected. I just mentioned you know, how language is still spoken, 
by communities, how to like, you know, it also provides a really intimate and detailed mapping of the local topography. I also want to underline how it also creates this kind of international, transnational links. One example, I would also go back to my field. One example will be another, you know, Mustafa, and he is, he is like, you know, in his 60s, and, uh, you know, the, during his youth, of course, he hated as a Turkish nationalist, he said he hated uh, the fact that he could speak Romeka because he was a Turkish nationalist and then he shouldn't be speaking the uh, language of Greeks. But when he went to uh, Libya to work in the 1970s and uh, 80s as a worker, he established friends, friendships with like the Greek workers there in, in Libya all the way across the Mediterranean. Since the 1960s, I come to, come to learn, many local businessmen grabbed construction projects uh, in the south of the Mediterranean, and then Mustafa was one of those uh, he, um, you know, who migrated to Libya for, I don't know, temporarily to work in these projects. And then he found, uh, he found the Greek friendship of Greeks homely in a foreign land. Back in Libya, he had been approached by Greek workers as he was talking to a Greek friend, uh, a local friend from Trabzon in Romeka, these sort of sporadic contacts evolved into rather long-term friendships with the Greeks who eventually visited his village in Trabzon and brought many others over the course of years. Through his prolonged contact and thanks to his fluency in Romeka, Mustafa also familiarized himself further with modern Greek and could easily communicate with them. You know, the, with Greek friends. In the following years, I was told Mustafa went on to visit his friends in Greece too and expanded his contacts to, uh, there because you know the his fellow towns, townsmanship is like really famous, the Hemsheri in Turkish. These encounters and the homely feeling uh, Mustafa mentioned did not necessarily mean, however, that he had forsaken his nationalist commitments. On the contrary, his paranoia around Greek irredentism in the region. Uh, in, in Turkish it's called Pontus Turk, was still intact and required him to be vigilant. So there is this kind of, you know, the dilemma that he's um, displaying. For this reason, Mustafa was both eager and hesitant about his connections, like many others, since being too close to Greeks also could look suspicious for Turkish nationalists. And uh, yet Mustafa's ongoing friendship, despite his staunch denial of Greek heritage of the region, through such unkind faced encounters of transnational scales, all despite their uncanny reverberation, seem to uncover how Greek heritage still lives on in ways that dwell both on their transfigured preservation in Turkey, as well as their breaching of national, national boundaries. Similar to Mustafa's experience, Hanafi, another self-professed nationalist in his 50s working as a teacher, also found out that his heritage was to forge unlikely encounters in unlikely places. As he is also from this, this you know, the um, off valley, uh, where he was fluent in Romeka, but he never uh, used this in his professional life or everyday life at all. But one day, he decided to drive through Ipsala, the border gate between Turkey and Greece, and then wanted to drive across Greece because he was curious about the country. As he drove on a motorway from Thessaloniki towards the southwest, Hanefi, I was told, noticed a car pursuing him. And then uh, the person car asked Hanifi, where, because he apparently saw the registry plate that the car was from Turkey. And then the guy asked Hanifi where in Turkey he was from, and according, upon hearing the answer, Trabzon, he immediately told Hanifi to follow him to his home. Apparently the man, a chief physician of a local hospital in the area, was also originally from Trabzon, a Pontic Greek, and wanted Hanifi to spend the night at his house, which he did. Eventually Hanifi, and the Greek doctor forged an enduring relationship and friendship. And the doctor started bringing a rather big group every year to the area, both to attend the annual Orthodox Christian Mass at Sumela Monastery in August, and to visit their ancestral villages across the city. I came across him and then the Greek doctor during one of these annual visits myself, where they played music and danced for on together. In one such gathering after the Mass at Sumela, I came to meet a number of other local men and women, who apparently had been in touch with the Greek doctor and his entourage. They eagerly recounted their experiences in the monastery and how they started learning modern Greek and how they even befriended the Orthodox patriarch through this contact. They were not religious, they emphasized, 
neither that much Muslim nor that much Christian, yet they involved and eagerly watched both. They said it did not feel strange or alien as they could communicate with their Greek guests with, their, with relative ease. They felt close somehow. This proximity or that feeling of homeliness, despite the differences in age, education, economic status, and or socio-political orientation, reminded me another experience from some years ago. While in the field, a young engineer I befriended had recounted a story of his encounters with a Pontic Greek visitor in Trabzon area. As he could understand Jamaica, I was told, this Greek visitor had immediately been invited to home for dinner by his mom. Whole family embraced him as if he were part of the, like you know the family himself. My interlocutor recounted, "It felt like as if we knew him all along." My interlocutor added, "He felt familial and intimate." So, how are we to understand these encounters? I'm asking. Should we really simply read them as a, the return of a hypothetically tolerant and multicultural past after a century of homogen homogenizing nationalism? I prefer not to, this will be the, you know, the, I try to go one step further. Then may we read them as reflections of the transfigurations of heritages in unexpected ways, that often elude rational thought and articulation. What shape do they take to live on despite and alongside a strong nationalist discourse? I had started the talk by reciting a presumption that's prevalent in contemporary Turkey. Has Greek heritage been uprooted from the Black Sea Troll? If not, how does it live on? I have no simple answers, but I have a number of reflections maybe. First, my suggestion is uh, if we fall, focus solely on the destruction, appropriation, and defacement of material of material heritages, such as buildings and monasteries, these are important. But if we solely focus on this, can we maybe be also overlooking how Greek heritage continues permeating the sociocultural lives of communities, local communities in different forms? that are not easily detectable from outside. In order to see how Greek has lived on, we must, I, I, I underline, we must also attend to intimate and elusive practices and narratives, such as this kind of thing, you know, how the language is preserved, despite the absence, the spectacular absence of like the institutional support, because there is no mechanism to teach Romeka, there is no writing system. You know, there are only two instances, one instance of like Romeka dictionary, and it's done by um, you know, uh, Wahid Tursun, and he's not a trained linguist. So even though it's a good endeavor in a sense to preserve this heritage, there are still you know, the, a lot done to preserve uh, Romeka as a linguistic entity. And then um, also I'm trying to focus on treasure hunts and how treasure hunt stories are also bringing this kind of um, different memories to the fore. And secondly, I'm going to ask, like, uh, can heritages take particular shapes that are not only immaterial, but also thoroughly attractive, feeling at home in a friendship far away from your own home, or being invited to a stranger's home in an unknown and yet strangely familiar country? May these also be counted as heritage? What happens to heritages across their transfigurations? You know, do they still preserve their essences? For instance, in the Greek, you know, the, we started the question is Greek heritage, but is Romeka still a part of like the Greek heritage per se, or is it just an amalgamation that breaches this kind of nationalist boundaries and matrices? It is, you know, the can it be said to the correspond to like a really homogeneous and then this kind of you know pure Greek heritage per se, or it's something else now? What happens to heritages across these transfigurations is hence an important question for me. And then when they are secluded to the privacy of the community, and then they are, when they are also configured as this kind of uncanny uh, elements of local identities, how are we going to um, implement policies of um, uh, preservation in a sense? You know, because uh, when I interview, I'm doing a uh, small research project with Ioan Asteridou of Cambridge University, and then we are also interviewing um, some of the heritage speakers. And then they are not always the most eager to preserve this heritage because, you know, for multiple reasons, because Romeka is not the most economically useful uh, language or cultural artifact of today's world, or they are too na Turkish nationalists, so they don't want to be associated with this Greek identity or cultural praxis. 
So there are multiple reasons of course, but what happens when uh, the community itself does not have this kind of you know, eagerness to preserve this uh, cultural entity. But this is what I want to want to say uh, about my research, about how the you know, the Greek heritage um, takes particular shapes in this you know, northeast Turkey and in different cities across Turkey, especially Istanbul and Bursa. And if you have questions, of course, I will be happy to answer. Thank you. Should I should I read the questions myself and then try to answer them or? Uh, I don't see the Q and A uh, button, Stefanos. What happened to it? It's there. I can see it actually. Oh, you can see it. I can see yeah. two questions. Oh, okay. Please go ahead because I cannot see it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one question by Costa. Should I read it out then? Yeah. I was wondering if the Turkish speakers or why. Pardon? Dala Yorgas, Dala Yorgas, Costa Dala Yorgas. Ah, Dala Yorgas, ah, sorry for my pronunciation. I was wondering if the Turkish speakers of Romeka you met define themselves as Muslims or as Orthodox Christians. Um, yes, the, the po communities that I worked with are really devout Muslims. There's a really strong um, this kind of religious tradition as well. The Off Valley is also important in terms of new orthodoxy in Turkey because it's also full of um, religious seminaries so they provided all this kind of you know the clergy Islamic clergy in the since the 18th century almost so there's this kind of really strong embeddedness in Sunni Islamic uh, establishment uh, you know that when you ask people for instance like there's always this kind of um, joke among the youngsters and they always ask their grandmothers, Grandma, are we Greek? And then they say, no, we are Muslims. There's this kind of really strong emphasis. Rather than this kind of nationalist boundaries, they define themselves you know, along the, this kind of Ottoman tradition. The Muslim identity comes first, and after this, you know, there's this kind of uh, national identities. But uh, Islamic sentiment is really strong first. Second, the community itself is extremely nationalist, you will you know, the Turkishness is also, especially for men, there's a really strong gender divide there. Men consider themselves first and foremost as Turkish nationalists. They overwhelmingly vote for uh, center-right, far-right parties, but really, I don't know, 80, 90% almost goes for nationalist parties. So they really strongly avoid any kind of association with a, Greek identity, but also Christianity. It's it's one of the biggest anxieties, you know. That's why the conversion stories or any insinuation of conversion is generally um, shied away. It's not like that articulated publicly, even though it's one of the latest uh, areas to be converted in the whole Anatolian plateau. It's one of the latecomers, and you know the area also is intriguing because. You know, it, came, it became Islamized relatively late and then through social conversion. And, you know, normally Islamization uh, also brings that, you know, a shift to Turkish. Mostly uh, communities uh, drop their pre-Islamic language and then shift to Turkish. But in these uh, small valley communities across the Black Sea Littoral, you see the you know the preservation of pre-Islamic languages as well. I don't know, Hamshin is an Armenian dialect. And in Rizya and Pazar, you see this kind of, you know, the preservation of this kind of Western Armenian dialects. And in Lazi as well, Lazi is not, uh, you know, the, the communities are bilingual generally. So they also preserve their pre-Islamic language. And then in the case of Trabzon, you have this kind of Romeka speaking communities. So there's uh, no uh, identification as Christian at all. Okay, so I... Go ahead, please. Yeah, pardon. If you want to read, please, go. you can read better, maybe. Okay, the next one is from uh, Costa de Jorgas also. What about your research truly surprised you? 
Indeed, because you know, I'm just I just finished today uh, writing a um, chapter on this, you know, the surprise in the field almost, and then I was just rethinking the question because when I went there, I you know, uh, I always thought it's a bit irreconcilable for Turkish nationalists to speak this kind of you know the Greek language as a native uh, mother tongue almost. And then I now realize after you know, looking back my own experience of, or through the field as well, yeah. and, uh, why? Why would, was I even uh, you know, intrigued by this preservation? Because you know, the one can be bought, I don't know, Turkish nationalists and speak this archaic language as well. Normally there's no association, of course, but in our nationalist orientation, generally we are all embedded in this nationalist world. Everyone is born to a nation, so we only have one allegiance and all these things. But of course, these are social contract, constructs. You know, in anthropology and political science, we discuss these as you know, the inventions of the last 250 years almost. And then uh, what I um, was most surprised, that people are more open to these ideas in their everyday life. But then, you know, when I went to the field, I had a more rigid idea of the field than them almost. They were, some of them also say, of course, back in the day, we might have been Greek, but now we are Turkish. And then you know, identity is something that you perform. So if you are bound to the Turkish Republic as you know, the, and then if you are patriotic, then they, no one can say that you are Greek or something else. And um, yeah, of course, you can, you can just speak up. And then, you know, the, what I try to say here is that, you know, the, sometimes before going to field, we also impose our own scheme of thought to the research process. And then people are more, I don't know, flexible and fluid in their identities. They do not care that much about, you know, it's also, of course, you know, when people, if I go there and ask, that does this mean that you are Greek then? Okay, they will deny it. They will just say no. But this also means uh, that they have this kind of awareness to all this, it's not a, like a forgotten, taboo, unspoken discussion. It's a part of their everyday conversations. They all, you know, they jokingly ask their grandmothers, Grandma, are we Greeks then? This is also like, this only shows that people are openly dealing with these kind of, you know, past uh, memories, even though they are, you know, contemporary identities, Turkish nationals. They can, you know, they engage with these, like, you know, questions. The next question is from uh, John Pierce. For all the speakers of uh, Romeika, older people, or did younger people speak it as well? Younger people, yeah. Transmission is waning. You know, the Iona uh, Stelu is a better expert on this, but you know, she did research. But uh, I know some as well. You know, the, the ones I could see, if they are living in the village, if they are living in the valley, then there's a good chance that they will learn the language. But um, even though you know this can be like a seven-year-old boy or you know the ten-year-old girl as well, they can still speak the language, but not as fluent as their grandmothers. You know, the grandmothers had a, like a wider vocabulary, like really extensive. Their everyday life was revolved around Jamaica, whereas nowadays, if they spoke, they spoke with limited vocabulary as well because it's not really part of their everyday life, and they are definitely bilingual. Anyone who speaks the language now is a bilingual one. Only the you know the those who lived before 1970s will be like uh, or 80s will be. Oh, uh, actually, one of our research participants was saying that the grandma did not speak Turkish. Actually, you know, the older generation could be monolingual, only Romeka speaker, but it's really rare these days. Anyone with younger generation, you know, the below, I know, younger than 40 even, they will definitely be bilingual at best. So you can find, if you go to the valley, you can find 10 year old who speaks the language as well. But the numbers are dwindling. It's going down definitely. It's really limited. You have to be in the valley and the valley population is limited as well. The next uh, question comes from uh, an anonymous attendee. Are Omeka and Greek mutually intelligible? And is Romeika a written language, if and if so, in Greek letters or Latin letters? I suppose you said it's not written, is that correct? No, there is no writing system, no. Uh, there are 
one attempt by Artursum to uh, you know to write everything in Greek alphabet, but I don't think it works that well. Or this is what I got from uh, because we were Peter uh, Macrich and uh, you know the Jonas Stern do, do not agree that much, especially you know the but you know this is their research project. For me, uh, they say they can understand, you know, but it's more archaic. You know, it's like one is like you know more. Uh, according to Ioana Steridus' research, Romeica must have descended from like really Hellenic Greek, you know, really old form. So it's, you can understand, I'm sure, but there's this kind of um, archaic features that you're not that familiar with, probably. But there is no writing system, so there is no written Romeica versions. And then because there's so much variation among villages and among valleys as well, not everyone, of course, you know, the, all of them are fluent and uh, literate in Turkish. So they tend to use Latin alphabet to transcribe when they write. And then this creates multiple problems because they don't have all the letters and then sounds. They don't correspond that well. So that everyone writes in a different way because they already have a different accent, but they try to uh, represent the sounds in different ways as well. Uh, the next question is from Savas. Uh, Savas cannot write the question, but I received it. I think his question was, when did the conversion started? I suppose you mean Savas the conversion from uh, Greek to to Turkish. Costa, to... Costa, there was a previous question by Savas above that, oh, I which is asking uh, were they okay. forcibly converted or voluntarily converted first? Okay, I can answer both actually. You know the communities emerge in mid. Um, mid 16th century as Christian Orthodox villages, by the way, the first ones. And it also corresponds to some kind of, after the takeover of the city of Trabzon by the Ottoman forces. Then, you know, the, these communities slowly, you know, the, it, this is called social conversion generally. Over the course of two centuries, we see like a consolidation of a Muslim majority. This, on, this means, you know, there's always a story uh, that, you know, some bishop converted, and then that's why the community converted. But the historical records show mixing. So it's not a forced one, apparently, because there's, but there's, of course, this kind of pool of, uh, especially in the 16th and 17th centuries, there's a um, appeal of Islam in the, you know, the, this kind of countryside, because, you know, the tax benefits, of course, and also like you know the stigma around you know the, who is in the uh, higher in the social hierarchy and everything and uh, it happens gradually and it happens quite slowly normally after the takeover a conversion takes place faster in other parts and then that's why the consolidation of Muslim majority in the valley is rather late according to uh, you know the historical records as well so uh, we can say it just you know, that's why you know the people. How do people understand this? They go to historical records, and then if the uh, you know, the person is named Abdullah, but his father is I don't know Alexandros, so they the, we assume that they converted uh, I don't know in one generation, and then still they have the. And then in any case, this is the story that the locals tell as well you know, that they converted centuries ago, and then uh, it was a mixed village. And then after a while, it's a uh, Muslim majority village. There, there's this kind of social progress, uh, transmission, maybe progression. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't see any other question. Let me ask a question. There was thriving Greek communities uh, in the area up to the time that they, uh, during the First World War, that uh, they were expelled and so, so on. Did they speak with a speaker of Omega? Did they have a communication with these people? Because if they did, definitely is not something of the very, very old past about why they speak this language or who they, what may be their origins, et cetera, et cetera. Two things. Yeah, you are right, actually, because you know the coastal communities, you know, the Black Sea, when we talk of this, this valley is uh, vertical to the uh, cost and then because they are so steep it's really hard to reach the mountains so in order to go somewhere you have to go to the coast 
and then go from there from the coast. And then you know that's why normally um, Greek Orthodox Christian communities, if they were religious or if they were town dwellers, they were generally alongside the coast. You know the, when you look at the valley, yes, exactly. The second part, you know, the second vertical uh, oval is generally where the Christian or Greek speaking communities were concentrated. They were mostly in the uh, coast of settlements. This area, though, you know, the, the area where I did research is like really elevated and secluded. Even though they emerge as uh, Christian communities, eventually, and it's really hard to reach, by the way, even today, there's only like one village. Nowadays, of course, they constructed the highway, but back in the day, even when I started my field work, there was this kind of really narrow road. And um, the point was, there was interaction, but limited interaction, but still interaction. And then in the, you know, the Pontiac community's uh, memoirs, they are mentioned as, you know, the, they are Muslim communities up in the mountain. They speak really, you know, pure Greek, you know, the, especially in Antonia, this is uh, accounts, you have this kind of, you know, the memoirs from grandmas and all these things. And then they have this, you know, some communities or over there, and they speak better than us. We forgot some old forms. And then the mm -hmm. interesting gist, of course, as far as I understand from Iona Stavros' account, is that normally we assume that because they converted in the 16th century or something, we assume that this was the form of the 16th century. However, the linguistic analysis shows that the language was already a conservative and archaic form when they converted. That means that they somehow deviated from the, you know, the uh, Greek koine of the area back in the day, almost like 500 years ago, more or the, even more. I think Iona is yeah. arguing that it's even older. You know, the, even in the conservative estimates will say that it is at least 1,000 year old, almost. That's why, you know, the interesting, just it's not resolved yet, but there is this kind of, uh, uh, even the Greek communities, because uh, of the literal, they say, they speak something really archaic, and then uh, some infinitives are still there. Iona's argument is that you know that they retain this kind of infinitive forms that are really archaic, and uh, that's why there was connection and then discussion. But imagine, of course, you know because the Greek communities of the coast are more uh, interacting, were interacting more with the you know both Istanbul and then the Greek movement in uh, you know the Athens and everything. So they were more prone to standardization already. They were open to influences from the modern parts of the empire and then the Hellenic Republic. That means the kingdom, but that means the Pontiac was already being influenced and then there was a divergence already. But even then, even if it did, this, this didn't happen, the community, the, you know, the Romeika as spoken by the communities that I work with, happens to be more conservative and older, you know, really archaic forms are retained there already. That's why it's so intriguing for us. You know, how, when they settled in this area, they were already speaking something really uh, old and uh, a bit uh, divergent. Uh, there's another question from Savas. Savas, can you put it back to, so I can read it? It is, it is there. Uh, in the chat, I guess. So go ahead and say it because I cannot okay, see. My, it. my question is, is there a record, a written record of Pontic Greeks, whether in Turkey, when they were in Turkey or when they uh, were eventually uh, refugees in Greece, uh, of any reference to these Romeika speakers up in the mountains, in the uh, uh -huh. uh, these Muslim, these Greek speaking Muslims, in other words? There is a, a number of, you know, the Yoga Antoniadis, and then I think he wrote his uh, memoirs and everything, and then there, there were references, definitely. And uh, also Pietro Bortene, and then he did some research uh, quite early, actually. And then there are some other, um, you know, those kind of old ambassadors, and uh, I think it's P Pietro Bortone. Then there was another two other researchers. I can just you know the, if you are interested, uh, write okay. an email and then I can just send you the resources because they stay in this one. That's why there's this kind of old Pietro Bortene text on Greek speaking Muslims of of. I think this was the article, and then they write how like you know there's this kind of really and then he was directed there by the other ones. It's like there's something going on in these villages up in the mountain. 
and they are so secluded and then they retain this really old form. And then when I talk to people, of course, in the villages, they say, ours is really archaic. I understand what they say, but it feels you know, corrupted. And they mm -hmm. compare the language to, you know, they say, imagine I am an Ottoman statesman and I speak with an archaic, you know, really elegant language, like really eloquent as well. And then imagine you are speaking to me now. This is what we feel. They say mm -hmm. ours is a bit, you know, the old form. It so feels so. And then when I hear Greeks, they say modern Greek speakers, they always say that there's, you know, I can understand them, but it feels, you know, different. And then uh, they always say ours is the pure Greek as well. No, oh, okay. It's also self description. Thanks. Oh, Thank you. Okay. Uh, do you hear me, Stefanos? Yes. Oh, because I have lost the screen completely. But anyway, if you can hear me, it's fine. Uh, so, if I understand well, then these people, uh, are there any other questions? Because I don't see any other questions. No. Oh, okay. Now, if I understand, uh, these people, on the one hand, uh, they want, they don't want to uh, show any connection with uh, Greek heritage. On the other hand, uh, they continue to speak this language. So I suppose that there is some value to them in order to continue to do that. So does this mean that they are afraid to accept it and to show that they are because there will be consequences in terms of uh, how they can uh, make their living or they can have a better life and so on, so on or how the authorities they are going to interact with them, etc. If you ask me, you know, the, this, uh, this is what generally people ask me as well. But my idea is that because first they are really embedded in the, uh, you know, the Turkish economic and political structures, they are quite sure. successful. In, you know, yeah. oh. And uh, also they genuinely believe, and then they, that's why I'm just like, you know, they can joke about it, like my grandma, Arabic Greeks, is also like, you know, sign that you know the identity is forged and refactioned non-stop they always say even if our grandfathers were greek christians that doesn't mean anything to me i'm a turkish okay. citizen you know there's yeah. this kind of really um strong belief that identity is what you make of it almost and then there is no essential character and then it's about your hard work that's why they are really uh, also Turkish nationalist and then uh, against the uh, Kurdish demands for education in Kurdish words. So they say, we are also have some kind of language, but we never demand. We work hard, we speak Turkish, and we try to fit in and all these things. And then this is our identity. And identity is not something that is fixed. It's just what you, what you make of it, almost. That's why they say Kurds should do the same. But uh, you don't have to agree with this politically. I, for me, if, as an anthropologist, there's something really culturally important in, uh, you know, Romeka, no? It's a heritage. It's in a like, really interesting linguistic identity as well. It also informs the local geography as well. It brings up these kind of objective memories to the fore. But still, they say something, you know, it's part of their subjectivity. That's why I don't think it's um, configured by this kind of fear of being a minority in Turkey. More, they just say, this is how identities are lived. It's something private. And it's, you know, that you can preserve your language. And they, you know, they are really high level bureaucrats, so politicians, businessmen. They say, no one intervene, intervenes in my you know, the everyday life. But you know, the, I speak it. I sometimes teach my children. But it's, you know, the people I interview with Ioanna, some of them say that it's useless in everyday life. They say, that, I'm an engineer doing data engineering, what am I going to use the uh, your maker for? And then we, we asked them, like, would you, for instance, be interested in learning more about language if we provide courses on training and all these things? They'd be like, not so much. Maybe I would prefer to learn Chinese or English better than yeah. uh, your maker. <laughs> Unfortunately, as an anthropologist, I would want them to preserve it, but that's my question. No? What happens when people are not that interested in preserving their own heritage? And then it's just destined to you know, almost disappear. Yeah. yeah. Let me ask another more general question. Uh, what the young Turks learn about uh, 
the Greek part of Asia Minor, and especially of the coastline of Asia Minor? Do they learn enough, much or whatever? Because I suppose if they learn school that well, there is formally in school that these areas they had a Greek past, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I don't know if these people they would face the their uh, uh, past in a different way. You know, the, it's uh, almost unavoidable. No? Some schools, they mm -hmm. have, I don't know, the Trabzon Museum in Trabzon now is um, also, but also, just a moment. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, you know, some people, you know, you go to there and it's one of the central areas yeah. of like the city of Trabzon, and then there's this like a fantastic museum. And then it's you know the showcase of the city, but everyone you know the, it says Kostaki mansion because it was the local banker family that had the mansion, and it's almost unavoidable. It's always reminded that there were some other people here, you know, Greeks yeah. were here. There's, it's always reminded, and people yes. would just say it's from it's you know uh, this is the yes, Greek yes. monastery, this is the you know this mosque was a church, yes. I and mean, in the city, but. I don't think it's engaged that much in schools. And I'm, you know, the, the sad thing is, I would say go one step further. Even when you provide this kind of information, I don't think younger generation is that much interested in any more, you know, these kind of things anymore. It's, you know, it's for them, so what almost, unfortunately. But, you know, they are interested in multiculturalism. They love this, you know, there were yeah. others here, but yeah. they don't want details. They only want, you know, there were some others here. But yeah. the younger Romeka speakers, I find them, some of them are really interested in the heritage. They want to learn more. Some of them are oblivious, but some of them are like, this is an important cultural heritage. Maybe we should preserve it. Yeah. So there is the Star Wars. I have a couple of questions. Uh, yes, please. Um, are these people uh, aware of their uh, history, the origin, their origin that they were at some point, uh, you know, of Greek? Uh, ancestry and christian uh, religion or are they completely uh, unaware of this uh, i'm talking about the ones that are in remote villages or in the mountains, uh -huh. mountains they are it's part of everyday conversation quite a lot you know they can just say yeah his grandfather was you know the Greek. it's not only greek by the way they're also you know because in the valley some really just can't speak greek either you know, there are some villages where there's no Romeka fluency at all. And then they generally explain that they are resettled Turks or they are resettled Armenians. So it's kind of, there's this kind of nonstop talk. I can't verify all of these. You, know, there's, you need to go to all the old archives and one by one check every one of them. But there is this conversion is a, like a huge topic. People talk about it quite a lot. You know, they say, you know, we came here. And then they, some of them can claim that we came from Central Asia. So we are new here is also a, a thing, but others will just say, no, his grandparents were, uh, I don't know, uh, great grandparents were Greek. So that's why they speak from because it's part of everyday conversation. So they know it quite well. So they know about it. In other words. Yeah, that's why the identity is not a fixed thing. That's, a, that's why they say, even if our grandparents were Greek, it doesn't matter Greek speaking Orthodox Christian. It doesn't mean anything because identity is what you know the you make of it almost. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so it's getting uh, very late. Let me ask a quick uh, last question, then we will close. Um, uh, I suppose at the site of uh, your university, I saw that there is a faculty on ancient history. Uh, when they say ancient history, what actually is the subject of uh, this faculty is dealing with? In, 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 in Turkish universities, you mean? Ancient history of the people of Turkey who came from Central Asia, what it is? Ancient history, Eskicha in Turkish. Uh, I assume this like the Bronze Age and all these things, Iron Age, when I heard this prehistoria and then all these things oh, in the university. Nice. Because, because I'm working in, um, in an archaeological project in Central Anatolia. Yeah. And there we have experts from the, you know, the, uh, you know, the Eskicha 
and all these things. And then they are working on this kind of, but I'm not sure. I'm not an expert on these things, but <laughs> as far as I know from my uh, project, yeah. there is this, um, yeah, when I, they say old history and you know, old age and all these things, ancient history, this means generally really prehistoric periods. I see. But they teach at all about the Byzantine past of Asia Minor? Uh, in the in high school, no. We don't really <laughs> study. No. I it's see. just more, mostly Ottoman Empire, Seljuk, and then the Central Asian ones. We stay uh, in the Turkish history books, you just, you know, the, there's this lineage of Central Asian empires, yeah. Seljuk in the Sultanate of Rome, yeah. and yeah. then the Ottoman Empire, mostly. I see. So. Uh, the Byzantine part of uh, the Greek, Greek heritage of Asia Minor no. is not not this one, but they uh, st we study. You know, if it's not changed, I don't know exactly the latest one. But you study the Western uh, um, Anatolian civilization, Ionians, yes, Phrygians, and all these things. Yeah, you study, but yes. um, but not the Byzantine. No. Because you know it's generally assumed to be not the Turkish past. I That's see. Why. Yeah, and, and because it makes me. I found it very striking that there were three or four faculty about the history of science and technology, and another three or four about even the instruments of science. But um, there is no. Oh, okay. In my university, you mean? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. I, they do. What? Ah, yes, they are. I don't know exactly their specialty, but some of them are really international, and then they do Roman history and all these things as well. But not East. I don't. I'm not sure if it's Eastern Roman, like Byzantine, but yes. Roman one I know definitely. One of okay. them. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm not sure exactly. By the way, but uh, Errol, I I I have uh, noticed that uh, there's always reference to anything that is. Uh, from the period of, let's say, classical to Roman, is always uh -huh. referred to as Roman. Uh, it's never referred to or rarely as Greek, because as you know, those oh, yeah. areas were basically first Greek and then became Roman, right? Yeah. So there is a, there's also, just like in the Byzantine period, uh, there is no reference to that. I think yeah. there's no, also no reference to the Greek uh, presence in 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 ancient uh, Asia Minor. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. that's why you know the Ro that's why we call it Romaica anyway. It's like Roman, no? In Turkish, yes. well, it's Romja, yes. which well, is like Roman. No, that, that's a, that's a different reason, I think. The the the, mm. the 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 that's that's different. Like why it's called Romaica is is because it was a uh, when Christianity prevailed in Asia Minor. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a uh, anathema to be called a Greek, because he, he was huh. uh, he was considered a pagan. A pagan. He was considered a pagan. So yeah. the Greeks avoided calling themselves Greek, and they preferred to be called Roman. So that way, they were able to, uh, in other words, escape okay. this, uh, this prejudice and this. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. I didn't know that actually. Yeah. yeah, but there was lots of violence against the pagans. Oh, Some yeah, of the yeah. emperors really they suppressed it very oh, yeah, strongly, and so on, so on. There was slaughtering, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Oh, so yeah. it's a very uh, violent past, you know, to erase it. Right. Anyway, well, well, so okay. Uh, if we don't have any other question, we thank you very, very much. You're great.